Thank you all so much for coming out tonight, and thank you for joining us. Uh, so, welcome. Uh, the first question I want to ask is super basic. How did this book come to be? Well, thanks. Well, first, um, I want to thank all of you for, for coming today. I'll, I'll start. Uh, thanks to Ware for that great introduction, uh, and to Town Hall for, for putting this together, and uh, Elliot Bay Books as well. Um, and to all of you for being here, I know uh, during the week it can be hard to get out to to, to events in the evenings, uh, so I really appreciate your, your coming for something like this. Um, so th this book, uh, and actually let me say one more thing. Uh, this is my first time to Seattle, um, and it was, it's amazing, it's amazing. I, I feel like I feel like um, I feel like you guys don't tell anybody about this place uh, to keep us all from coming, because because uh, and and I'll try not to spread the news uh, too much. But this is an amazingly kept secret, uh, and it's been I've had a lovely day here so far. Um, tell everyone it rained all the time you were here. I, I'll tell them that, even though you know we all know that it was absolutely gorgeous today. Um, so, uh, so, so I've loved it here. But, but so, you, so you asked about how the book came about. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this book for for a long time. Uh, I I started uh, early on. I mean, even as as a as a high school kid, but really in in college and in law school, being very interested in. Uh, constitutional history, constitutional theory. Um, the basic structure and functioning of our government uh, and, um, and how it worked, how it didn't work, why it worked, uh, and how it came to be. And what I thought was so extraordinary was when you think back to the late 18th century, uh, what you have in America are a group of people living really on the edge of the world, uh, sparsely populated on the Atlantic coast. There are some towns, Boston, Philadelphia, not that big. Um, and uh, the center of the universe to them, London, Paris, is quite far away. Uh, and they decide, they think they can come up with a whole new kind of government and that they're going to create it themselves. I mean, this is an audacious undertaking. I mean, pretty extraordinary to think that you could do something like that. And it took a lot of creativity, uh, and it actually took a lot of understanding, history, philosophy, economics, politics, um, and they were deep students of all of these things as they thought about how to create this kind of government. I always thought that was just an extraordinary moment uh, and one worth really studying. And so um, uh, I went to law school. I, I studied constitutional theory uh, and constitutional law uh, to pursue this interest. Um, Soon after that, uh, the, I, I don't, I've been for a very long time interested in economic issues, but uh, in 2008, the financial crash uh, happened um, and was thrust uh, in, into the middle of it a little bit more than, than I would have otherwise expected. Um, my contracts professor from law school, uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, was involved uh, in both the congressional oversight of uh, how the government was spending the bailout money uh, and then later on in the reform process to create the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, and so as a, as, as a student of hers, um, a co-author of hers, and advisor of hers, worked with her on, on, on those efforts. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and through that experience, um, really uh, decided when I came back to being an academic uh, to merge these two things and really focus hard on thinking about um, economic issues in the context of constitutional theory. So uh, in, in large part going back to a lot of the questions I was interested in and had been interested in for a long time, uh, but through this lens of what I think is one of the biggest challenges uh, of our time. So now this book is, it's, it's a huge and impressive undertaking. Uh, it goes from ancient Greece to modern day. Uh, and I'm curious if, uh, so a really basic run through the thesis is that the Constitution is a middle class document and that the middle class is essential for political stability. Uh, was that your thesis when you began the book or uh, did that change over the course of, of the writing of the book? Yeah, so uh, l let me say something first about the, the thesis um, and, and, and then we can talk a little bit about, the, I about the writing process. Um, so the, the argument of the book is that economic inequality is a threat to our constitutional system, a threat to our republic. Uh, and this might seem surprising because the Constitution doesn't say middle class in it, doesn't say economic equality, doesn't say economic inequality. None of those words uh, in the, or phrases are, are in the, our Constitution. And if anything, these days the Constitution seems like it cuts against doing anything about economic equality. For example, the First Amendment. Uh, interpreted in cases like Citizens United, gives wealthy people and corporations disproportionate power over public policy. 
uh, rather than trying to make the playing field level. Um, so what's the reason that the Constitution has anything to do with this? Uh, and, and the argument that I make in the book is that from the ancient world through the 18th century, uh, people were very, very concerned about the problems of economic inequality. And the worry was that either the rich would confiscate, uh, would, would oppress the poor, or the poor would confiscate the wealth of the rich. And the result in those kinds of societies, societies with deep inequality, would be strife, violence, and revolution. And so the question was, how do you solve this problem? And people came up with two answers. The first answer was that we could build economic inequality right into the structure of government. So if you think about England, there's a house of lords for the wealthy. There's a house of commons for everybody else. In ancient Rome, there's a patrician senate. But then there's a tribune of the plebs for the poor. I call these class warfare constitutions because they build class conflict right into the structure of government. And the idea is that both classes, rich and poor, have a share in government, a stake in government, but they also have a check on the other, and that's what creates stability. So that's the first approach. The second approach to this problem uh, for, was first uh, really presented by Aristotle, and what Aristotle says is the best possible constitution that you could come up with would be a constitution which the middle class was bigger than the rich and the poor and therefore in which the middle class governed. And he called this a middle constitution, I call it a middle class constitution, hence the title of the book. Uh, and this, this answer is, re is really a cheat on Aristotle's part. It doesn't actually solve the problem of inequality, it just sort of assumes it away. If you don't have economic inequality, if you have a big middle class, not that many people who are that rich or that poor, you're not gonna have conflict between rich and poor because everybody's relatively equal. Uh, so those were the two solutions, the class warfare constitution and the middle class constitution. And the argument of the book is that when the founders looked around, as I mentioned, they were you know, pretty far from, from Europe. What they saw was how different they were from Europe. In America, there was no feudalism, unlike in Europe. In America, there was no hereditary aristocracy, unlike in Europe. In America, even the richest people, your George Washingtons, who were pretty wealthy, uh, were nothing compared to the dukes and duchesses of Europe who lived in gigantic marble palaces. So the degree of relative equality here was pretty extraordinary. Um, and there are some economists uh, who've, who've put together measures and, and suggest that they were actually right in thinking that America was relatively equal. And so when the founders looked around, what they thought was, we don't need a class warfare constitution. We don't need a tribune of the plebs or something like this. Um, because we're actually relatively equal here. And so even though they debated uh, things like property requirements for being a, a, a senator, um, in fact, they debated these things in their state constitutions. The state constitutions in the revolutionary period, many of them had those kind of provisions, but our federal constitution doesn't. There's no tribune of the plebs. There's no monetary requirement to be a senator. Uh, and, and that's a radical change. It's a big shift in how we think about the structure of government. And so that's the kind of core argument uh, of, of, of the book. Um, I had, when I, when I started writing it, a, a sense of this, but not, a, not as sharp as it, as it developed, and that was part of the fun of going back through kind of original sources in the founding era and discovering uh, just how rich the debate was at that time over questions of, of economic uh, equality and inequality, uh, and a lot of the assumptions that the founders had about what kind of society uh, they were designing a constitution for. And uh, since I assume most of the people here haven't read the book, uh, for the purposes of our discussion, uh, can we define middle class? Because a lot of politicians use it to mean anybody who's not the top 1%. Um, it's become sort of amorphous. So, so for the purposes of the book and the conversation. Yeah, so, so this is always a really uh, hard question, I think, for anybody who uses the phrase middle class. And, I, and, um, and it's a hard question because lots of people have different things that they want from this definition. Some people really want to pin down people on like, give me an exact dollar number that counts. Th this doesn't make any sense because we can't actually have a dollar figure that counts across countries, across time periods. You know, like, 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 like Paul said, the book starts with ancient Greece and goes to the present. The idea, if you say, you know, the median income in America is $50,000, th that's like meaningless in ancient Athens. It really has no, there's no way to think about that. So in the book, I define middle class as just not the extremely rich or the extremely poor. So it's a, it's a big category. Um, 
Uh, and that's how I think about it, because that's a pretty consistent usage throughout uh, the history of political and constitutional thought and how people are thinking about it. Um, and they do think about this. It's sort of, it's anachronistic to use the phrase middle, middle class, but as I said, Aristotle talks about the middle constitution as the people who are not rich or poor, the ones who are in the middle. Um, in, in the Renaissance period, you see people talking about the, I don't know how to say it in Italian, the mediocre, who are the kind of mediocre, not too rich, not too, not too poor. Um, there are, in the founding generation, people talk about the middling sort, the middling classes, the middling people, the middle people. Uh, they're all getting at the same idea here, not the rich, not the poor. They talk about the rich and the poor too. Um, but all of that is sort of clunky and middle class kind of grabs that meaning even though it's a, a, a later term per se. Um, so that's how I think about it. Um, this is, this is incorporates in a way but is sort of distinct from another prominent way of thinking about the middle class which is that it's really a cultural thing. It's about a certain level of education, a certain set of cultural styles. Uh, again, that emerges in a later period that's a Victorian and post-Victorian uh, notion of it that is less true in, in how people talk about it from the ancients onward. So that's not the definition that I, that I use for it. Okay. So since you uh, fully understand the scope of American history from its beginning to today, uh, what historical point uh, is most equivalent to where we are right now in terms of inequality? So, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll run you through briefly the history because I think it gets exactly this point. Um, so in the founding, uh, as I argue, we have this relative economic equality uh, among white men, mostly. And, and the reason why this, this persists, when they look around, I said, talked about feudalism, talked a little bit about hereditary aristocracy, uh, but there's one more thing. Uh, and the other thing is that they look around and see that they have vast lands available to the West. Uh, and what that means is that any white man, it's limited, we can talk about that uh, as well, um, can get some property and have property, and property is the major form of wealth. It also allows people to be economically independent because they can work the land uh, and operate, and that's the chance for people to be in the middle class, to be economically independent. Now, the moment that I think is most similar to our moment is the late um, 19th century, the Gilded Age. Uh, and what happens in the Gilded Age is everything changes economically. Industrialization, urbanization, the closing of the frontier, the shift from agricultural work and artisanal work to wage labor in factories. These are significant changes and they put serious pressure on the economic assumptions that undergird our constitutional system. And people at the time recognized this. Populists, progressives, and others worried openly that what was happening was we were seeing increased economic inequality concentration of economic power in the hands of a smaller and smaller group of people, robber barons, sometimes referred to as plutocrats, uh, and that these people were taking over the government. Uh, they were buying senators by buying state legislatures through bribery. They were actively involved in trying to control every aspect of politics in the state and that this was a threat to the republic, uh, a threat to our constitutional system. And so what they did at the time um, was they engaged in a variety of actions both to try to reshape the economic structure of the country and also reshape the political structure. So the progressives and the populists invent antitrust laws to break up concentrated economic power. They pass a constitutional amendment to allow for income taxes so that people who have a greater ability to pay can pay more. That's on the economic side. On the political side, they, um, they pass the first campaign finance regulations to try to prevent the wealthy people from having more influence in politics. They also pass a constitutional amendment for the direct election of senators to prevent bribery and other things that are going on in state legislatures and instead have the people select the senators. Uh, they create initiatives and referenda. Uh, these are all kind of demo democratizing efforts uh, and the idea here is to bring power back to the people and take it away from the wealthy who have this disproportionate influence. And, the, and you know, Teddy Roosevelt says, uh, there can be no such thing as a political democracy without an economic democracy. And that is a, a, a spirit that inspires the period and they try to take action on both of these fronts to confront exactly some of the similar problems we face today. So, um, how'd they do that? You, you, you describe a, uh, in the book, and you just talked about it here, uh, this remarkable, what sounds like a remarkable period of progressive activity with constitutional amendments, which are very hard to do by design, uh, passing, uh, it's, you know, it's no small trick. I mean, do you think that 
Do you see the elements for that kind of a progressive wave now? And if so, how do we activate it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so how did they do it? So one of the things that's so exciting about the progressive era going back is you see two sets of things happening. The first is that you see a lot of grassroots energy and excitement. There are people everywhere around the country who are organizing. And it's not just for a day or a week or a month. It's not like that. It's all the time for a long period of time. Uh, for years and years and years. So the populists organized for years all across the country, and there's lots of different groups. There's the Farmers Alliance, there's the Knights of Labor, there's lots of groups that are excited about, um, about taking on action. Uh, and so you see these kind of big grassroots movements. The second thing that you see is you see real leaders. So you see people who are willing to take on big political fights and have some spine. And Teddy Roosevelt, I think, is one of the best examples of, of someone like this, uh, considered a traitor to his class for, for being willing to take on big progressive fights. Uh, so you see that happening at the same time. So there's a component of a kind of grassroots effort, and then there's also leadership that's a big part of the, a big part of the story. Um, and I think, you know, to, to your point, is this something that's doable today? I think it absolutely is. Uh, we have, uh, I think part of what happens is, um, especially now, is we have increased interest and attention into politics and an understanding that there's a lot of things that are broken uh, in the system right now. And I think you under people understand that on, on both sides. Uh, you know, no one, uh, everyone here, I, I don't see any small babies. Everyone here lived through the 2016 election. Um, and, if you, and if you lived through the 2016 election, you know uh, that on both the, the left, Bernie Sanders supporters, and on, on the right, Donald Trump supporters, there was a lot of anger about economic issues, about economic inequality, and the rhetoric that was used, you can put aside the policy, but the rhetoric that was used was trying to tap into that. So there's a widespread sense that this is a problem, and that's the kind of energy that can, you know, hopefully push into a movement to actually change something. Okay. Uh, well, to make things darker for a minute, is there... Uh, uh, is there an American precedent for what might happen if inequality gets worse here, or do we have to look outward to international examples? So, so one of the one of the challenges I think you know in the American context, um, there there are we've had times where we've been very unequal. The Gilded Age is, is one of them, uh, and you know it's not it's not great. Um, so I've got a there's a passage in the book um, about uh, Montana and the kind of corruption that was going on in Montana in the 1890s and 19 zeros. Uh, and there were, it's called the War of the Copper Kings is how people at the time talked about it. And there were a bunch of copper magnates who went around buying state legislatures. Uh, they bought up newspapers, they tried to, uh, they fought over where the capital of the state was gonna be um, so that it could be in one person's company town or the others. Uh, and, and, and there was a lot of, of corruption in this period. Um, this was not a great thing, and, and people in Montana fought back, and they actually passed a bunch of laws, uh, including a Corrupt Practices Act, to try to break the power of, of the Copper Kings uh, over the state. Um, so, you know, we've had times when it's been pretty bad, and when corruption has been pretty brazen and pretty blatant. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the concern is that um, if, if you wait too long, if this goes on for too long, uh, it could lead to far, far worse uh, consequences. And, and, and here's what, you know, if you think about the founders, here's what, here's what they said. Their concern was on the one hand, um, what you would have is either uh, when, when they, the way they say it, when the, when the rich plunder the poor, you know, this is John Taylor of Virginia in 1814, says when the rich plunder the poor, it is slow and legal. You never, you never actually see a, a constitutional amendment saying, you know, we're now an oligarchy. It, it just happens, and you wake up one day, and it turns out all the laws that have been passed, you know, slowly over time skew the structure of the economy to favor the wealthy, and they skew the structure of politics to favor wealthy people having more influence, uh, and then this creates this vicious cycle. And the vicious cycle is as the policies favor the wealthy more, the wealthy then use their increased wealth to influence policy. Uh, and then the policies favor the wealthy more, and the cycle just continues and continues. And so that's how oligarchy emerges. Um, you know, the other side of the story is that people uh, are, are smart, and they see that the oligarchy is emerging, and they want to revolt against it. And so the concern, they don't, it's not some sort of anarchy that happens, mob rule or something. Uh, they look for leadership, someone who will actually try to overthrow 
the oligarchy. Um, and I'll, and I'll, 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 you know, one of the one of the um, more more prescient and, and, and compelling, I think, uh, uh, comments is from a, a Broadway uh, sensation. Uh, his name is Alexander Hamilton. Uh, you may have heard of him. Uh, he's an excellent singer and rapper. Uh, but uh, before he was known for that, uh, it turns out he was very influential at the or origins of the country. Uh, and in the very first of the Federalist Papers, he worries that the biggest threat to, to liberty in many republics uh, is that um, the people will be seduced by uh, a demagogue who will then turn into a tyrant. Uh, and so the concern about inequality and the fate of an unequal republic is that, again, you end up with either some sort of oligarchy or you have the revolt against the oligarchs. Uh, and both are destabilizing and a serious problem. Um, I've gone on for much too long, so. so no, 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 so. That, that, that's good. I'm just, I'm still reeling from the fact that Alexander Hamilton is real. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, internationally uh, speaking, there are, you have, you have examples of nations that have that have uh, that have tipped over into into the, the point of no return. Uh, are there any any thinkers who you you follow on the international scene who who apply to America today? Yeah, that's great. So one of the really interesting things internationally is there's been a ton of work done by political scientists uh, and sociologists on the relationship between a rising middle class and democracy. Uh, and uh, a lot of this work suggests that a rising middle class can actually be destabilizing for politics uh, because the rising middle class wants a share of political power if they're in an authoritarian society. Uh, and so you get transitions from authoritarian societies to democracies sometimes when you see this middle class rising because they demand a share of, of political power. Uh, and that's something that a lot of political thinkers, um, political scientists, uh, Sam Huntington, Barrington Moore, uh, Francis Fukuyama, others have talked about in really excellent work in comparative politics. Uh, what's also really interesting about that is it actually ties into a core person I talk about in the book, uh, a 17th century English political philosopher named James Harrington, uh, who most people haven't really heard about, but who is pretty important. And, and what Harrington uh, said is that the balance of power in, in politics in a society will always uh, mirror the balance of property. We think of that as the balance of wealth in society. Uh, and the reason why, he said, is, is exactly this. It's that people who have economic power will demand an, uh, the share of political power in relationship to their wealth. And so in any society where there's concentrated wealth, you'll end up with some sort of aristocracy. By force or by these kind of slow and legal efforts, you'll end up with something in that category. Um, but what he saw was something very interesting. The king had played the nobles off of the people. Uh, in, in, in England a uh, hundred years before uh, Harrington was writing or so. Uh, and this led the people to start have some property uh, and it created a slow and small little middle class that started growing of yeoman farmers and property owners. Uh, and over time as they gained uh, and became bigger and bigger, uh, they demanded a share in governing. And this he says was the causes of the English Civil Wars the creation of the Commonwealth in England in, in the 17th century. Um, and that's a lot of obscure and old history, so don't worry too much about it. But the key thing is the founders knew a lot about this. They, they, they read Harrington, they thought about this, they had seen this, this book, and they all talk about exactly this theory um, and, and how the rising middle class can, uh, well, they don't talk about the theory so much, but, they, but they, they talk about this idea that the balance of power has to follow the balance of, of property or wealth in society. Um, the, the, the surprising thing is that Harrington and all the 20th century thinkers, or Sam Huntington's and Francis Fukuyama's, uh, don't do as much on what happens when you have a shrinking middle class. Uh, Fukuyama has a great chapter uh, in, in one of his more recent books on exactly this question. He's probably the only person who's really uh, uh, dove into it head first in the comparative context. But the main focus has always been the rising middle class. And I think one of the real concerns we have now is how do we think about what happens when the middle class is shrinking? And we just don't have a lot of, of work that's been done on that, I think, in, a, in, in as serious a way that, as one would hope. That is a remarkable gap in, uh, in, in, uh, in academic thought. Uh, I, I, I really loved the Harrington parts in this book. He's sort of like a, a hero of the book. And as you say, he was well read at the time of the Founding Fathers. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious what, what happened 
to to Harrington that that you that you you know had to dig him up for this. It's like an Indiana Jones of constitutional history. Right. Well, I, okay. I've never been compared to, to him, but uh, uh, I don't know if I can pull off the hat. You can the issue. Just just put that on the blurb of the I'll, paperback. I'll, I'll think about that. Yeah, if I can get the right hat, we'll try. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you know, uh, uh, Harrington Harrington's uh, surprisingly is very well known among uh, political philosophers and historians of, of political thought, um, and uh, there was a, a big movement of of people in the mid to late, uh, in, say the between say the 1950s and the 1980s um, to resurrect a bunch of thinkers in, in the history of political thought, Machiavelli, Harrington, uh, and others who, who are largely uh, considered Republicans, so with a small r, not partisan in our sense, um, but they believe in a republic and what it meant to have a republic. And the literature on these folks uh, focused a lot on civic virtue. Um, the idea that what citizens needed for a republic was to be virtuous, and there's a lot of talk about what was included in virtue. So uh, property ownership, in some cases, was a component of virtue, education, uh, service in the military, uh, different kinds of values and, and experiences that would lead to, to virtue. And there's a lot of debate about that. And, and Harrington came back in some component, uh, in, in, some, in some of the works on that, and so is, is known among uh, political theorists for that. What's surprising is Harrington has this other streak um, which is less about the individual virtue of citizens and is more about the distribution of wealth in society. And that is, a, is only something that more recently has been uh, recovered, I think, by, um, or emphasized by, uh, by political theorists and others. And so part of the, part of the goal of, the, of, of this book was to bring that into our, our normal consciousness of how we think about the Constitution because um, the stories we often tell ourselves are uh, are, are sort of a John Locke story and often focuses on Jefferson, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, uh, the social contract, individualism, um, or a story about the Republic, and this is about virtue and, and that kind of thing. But this egalitarian story is really not told, uh, and I think it's an important one that, that needs to be told. Uh, and so uh, when you agree to do one of these, the publisher sends you uh, an advanced reader copy, which is a very stripped down version. Uh, there's usually not much difference between that and the published book, uh, but there was a very important passage that was changed between this book and, and the publication, and it had to do with um, uh, the presidential election of 2016. Uh, and it's not as though you, you predict that Hillary Clinton's going to win or anything like that, but there obviously had to be some changes made to the, uh, to the, to the passage uh, between the election and, and now. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about the changing of that passage, since publication usually takes such a long time, uh, and also talk about uh, if, how you feel about the book in, in the age of Trump, which you maybe didn't you know, foresee uh, is, is happening. So, uh, well, so just so, just so everyone knows, there's, there's not much on 2016. It's about a page and a half, so it wasn't much. And it, that was by design. Uh, you know, when, when you start writing something like this that you think is, um, uh, that, that may be relevant to, to the times, uh, you also don't want to be captive to a particular moment. And, and part of the book, uh, a big chunk of it is history uh, and, and will hopefully... Uh, stand for longer than being kind of a flavor of the month kind of book. That's, that's Yeah, it was, it's that's literally the, a page and a half. I read it so, backstage. Uh, so, so, so it's, it's not like, much. So, <laughs> um, so, so in that sense, there's a lot more to the book. And so part of the idea in, in writing even just that small amount was to have a, a little piece of it, but, um, but to not have it so overwhelm, uh, overwhelm the book. So I knew I was going to have to rewrite it completely when I wrote it the first time uh, because you have no idea what was, what, what was going to happen in the election. Uh, in terms of thinking about today, you know, I, I think um, I, I wrote the book before the election, uh, and um, and I thought it was an urgent book, regardless of who was going to win. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is one of the biggest things that we uh, often in our discourse today are ignoring. Is you know, there's a lot of talk. Are we in a constitutional crisis uh, right now? Um, you know, and and I think. Not yet, necessarily. Maybe we will be. Maybe we won't be. But not yet. And you know, the example people give is if these uh, the 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 Muslim ban, um, and and when uh, but but when you know the president tweets, uh, "See you in court." Well, that's actually the Constitution working. Uh, it means lawyers are going to be involved. It means judges are going to be involved. 
uh, if the president ignores the decision of the Supreme Court when we ultimately get to that stage, then we can have a conversation about a constitutional crisis. But you know, at this point, you know, see you in court looks like the Constitution working. Um, but I think what's important here is had Secretary Clinton won, you know, I think the book is still important because the real constitutional crisis isn't something I think right now that, that is just emerges in a, in a flash of a second. It's this slow boiling constitutional crisis that we've actually been sinking into without noticing for decades now. Um, and, and that is the real issue uh, and, and that's the inequality problem. And, and I think that cuts at the very core of our constitutional structure because, and, and this is the core argument of the book, our constitution was not designed for a society that was deeply unequal. It was designed for a society with relative economic equality. Um, and so when you change these underlying social conditions, that puts a lot of pressure on the structure of the government, which wasn't designed for those conditions. Uh, and that's the crisis I think we're, we're facing. And I think we're in that crisis right now. Uh, and that I think exists regardless of who's president. I don't think it would have been, uh, I don't think it would be solved if, if, if President Trump were to, to stop being president uh, tomorrow. Um, and I don't think it would have been solved uh, if, if Secretary Clinton had won and was president today. Uh, we would still be facing this crisis in a serious way. I want to talk about solutions, uh, and uh, and I want to give people uh, a little bit of hope here. Uh, what what do you think uh, we should be doing when we leave when we leave here tonight? What 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 does America need us to do now to resolve this problem? Okay, so we'll talk about two things. So first is we should talk about some policy stuff, and then we should talk about some political stuff. So on the policy side, I think the answers are largely things that are really inspired by the progressives and the populists, because they confronted this, a similar set of challenges to ours in the Gilded Age. And again, as I said, there are two sets of things. First, how do you reshape the economy? And then the second is how do you reshape the political system? And in both cases, to try to align political democracy, to, to revive political democracy by reviving economic democracy, uh, to use the Teddy Roosevelt framing. So things like antitrust uh, and thinking about how to regulate the financial industry, thinking about um, minimum wages, uh, you know, th these are the kind of economic policies that we want to think about. Uh, on the political side, there's a lot of things we can talk about. We can talk about voting, we can talk about campaign finance reform. Uh, there's a lot of policy changes we can make in terms of how our political structures function. I'm happy to talk more about any of these specifically, but those are the big categories. Um, the second part is the politics part. And that's the place where I think the, the, what, what the history really shows is none of this works without people being engaged. Uh, there's no change that happens without massive grassroots pressure and support. Uh, and without pressure being put on people in government to make changes because it's too easy for them to roll over when the going gets tough. That there have to be people to steal their spines. And so that is something you see throughout this period are really engaged active people um, out there uh, after every financial panic, uh, after every uh, uh, major crisis. Uh, going forward and and trying to advocate for serious change in this period. And so I think those are the big things. So I, I would, uh, you know, advise you to, to um, learn about the policy stuff and, and be involved in the process with your, your representatives. Okay. Yep. Um, glad we've got a, a constitutional scholar here to talk to us, and you brought this up yourself. So I wonder if you could share with us your opinion and how it's grounded in the Constitution of the majority opinion in Citizens United. Um, so, uh, Citizens United, um, as you all know, is an opinion about the First Amendment and the, um, about how uh, money can be speech uh, that is uh, something that corporations can use to spend in, in elections. So everyone sort of knows the basics of this. Um, you know, the, the key thing that's, that we have in our First Amendment uh, uh, jurisprudence around this is, is a question about what the rationale might be for regulating uh, money as speech. And the idea that money as speech comes from a case called Buckley versus Vallejo, very old case from the 70s. Uh, and within that framework, what the court had said for many years is that there were two possible uh, justifications. First is uh, corruption or the appearance of corruption. And that was seen as kind of quid pro quo bribery, the appearance of it, other kinds of things in that category. Uh, and then a second justification that was given uh, it was called the anti-distortion rationale, which I know is pretty clunky. But the idea here is that 
there's a political uh, marketplace, there's kind of a, um, a, 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 an area in which we have debate over politics, uh, and this can be distorted, not at the individual level, which is the kind of corruption of one official, but the entire discourse can be tilted. And that, that might be a reason also to regulate. And so what's happened over time is that the Supreme Court, uh, including in Citizens United and then in, in, in a later case called McCutcheon, has basically abandoned the anti-distortion rationale altogether, uh, leaving us with a very, very slim understanding of what corruption is, which is quid pro quo kind of corruption, very direct corruption, and maybe its appearance as well. Uh, and, and that is a very severely contracted understanding of what corrupts the political system. Uh, and I think that's a problem um, because, you know, you know, quid pro quo corruption, also a phrase that's not in the, in the First Amendment. In fact, money as speech, not in the First Amendment per se, right? The First Amendment doesn't say that explicitly. These are all court cases that have tried to flesh out the meaning of the First Amendment over time. Um, and these are all highly contested cases, right? You have four justices saying one thing and five saying another thing. Um, so I think there's a way in which, uh, you know, the interpretation could have easily gone the other direction if you had a slightly different composition of the court. Um, but I think that anti-distortion rationale is a very important one uh, for thinking about where the corruption is, is within the system, which is that it's not necessarily just at the level of, of individual bribery. It's, it's the whole structure of the system. Um, hi, during the, the 50s, right after, the, after World War II, uh, I think our society was fairly equal as well. Um, what happened? Uh, did the, the middle class lose their, their uh, civic virtue? Did the oligarchs snooker the middle class? Or how did we get to where we are from where we were? Great question. So, so, so we have all these fights. We talk about the progressives. We have all these fights in the progressive era, and those lead into the New Deal. And uh, we have a bunch of fights more in the New Deal. And then World War II happens. And after World War II, the idea that economic inequality is a problem for the republic, a problem of constitutional magnitude, sort of goes away. Um, it really wanes in the, in the period after World War II. I think this happens for, for three reasons, and I'll say something about how we got there. So uh, the first reason is that the New Dealers won on a big constitutional question. And the question was whether the federal government had the power and ability to regulate the, the economy, act in the economy in different ways. Uh, and after the New Deal, there was widespread consensus that the answer to this was yes. And so debates left the constitutional realm and just moved to be questions of policy. Um, was it just, is it good, is it a bad idea, but not something of constitutional significance. Everyone agreed the feds can, can regulate uh, or act within the national economy. The second big change was, uh, was, was the Cold War, um, and, and I'll explain why. Basically, from the beginning of the Republic onward, uh, the frame of reference for a lot of people here was Europe. Generations of people had come from Europe to America, and when they came, they left monarchies and aristocracies in order to come to a republic. Uh, this wasn't some, an aristocracy wasn't something you read about in history books about ancient Greece. It was there. There were lords. <laughs> there were ladies. This was a real thing that existed in the world and they could see that there was a difference between their society and the other. After World War II, the comparison is now communism against capitalism. That is the great struggle. And communism's egalitarian bent leads to fears that that will take over and the egalitarian American tradition, the republic, the tradition of egalitarianism in a republic uh, falls away. The third big change uh, is that um, our country uh, goes through a huge economic boom and we see a rising middle class. And this is a period that economists call the Great Compression uh, because we have extremely low inequality during this period. Uh, GDP is up, median uh, wages for workers are up. Um, and, and this is when the middle class really grows. And, and this happens for a bunch of reasons. Uh, and a lot of them are policy reasons. Uh, so in the, in the New Deal period, we regulated finance. Uh, we created the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, we had Glass-Steagall, which separated investment banking from depository banking. Uh, we had pretty high tax rates during this period as well. Uh, and we also did things to invest in building a middle class. So a G, the GI Bill sent a generation of people to college. We had infrastructure, like a highway system, which created lots of jobs and actually, uh, because it's kind of basic infrastructure, allowed for more jobs, like trucking and transportation and ease of commerce. Uh, we invested in research. 
uh, and development in a bunch of ways, the space race, the internet, lots of things that created booms as well. Um, so, there were, uh, so there were a lot of actions to try to build the middle class. And then there were also actions to try to lift up the people who are the poorest. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, a variety of programs uh, often associated with the Great Society uh, in, in Lyndon Johnson's time. And so the combination of these things we meant that we had a relatively equal uh, society during this period. Um, so I think a big chunk of how we got there was we had policies that uh, we implemented because we wanted to get there. And that was part of our, our national goal uh, or, or set of goals uh, coming out of World War II. Not really sure how to phrase this exactly, but so it sounds like um, what you're saying is our political system, the ideology of it is founded on a basis of somewhat equal economic standpoints, right? And then that the moment that was most similar to what we're going through now was sometime during the beginning of industrialism, which kind of transitioned us into what we're doing and what we're continuing to do. And so what I'm curious about is, was it the shift in the way economics functioned and the, like, the ideological foundations of capitalism that kind of influenced our political system? Or was it that we didn't perhaps outline specifically what type of economic system we needed to have that kind of led us to this point? So I think there's a couple of things. Um, the, so one change that you, that you rightly point out is, is what happens in the economy. Uh, and so there's big changes happening in the economy we associate with industrialization. So easy example is shifting from agriculture to, to factories or to artisanal labor to factory labor. This is a big shift in the economy. A second set of changes that come with that because you know economic changes aren't just uh, things that naturally happen and have natural consequences, is there are policies that are undertaken to grapple with those changes and to shape and constrain them uh, and, and to push their direction. And so in this period, uh, you also saw a bunch of policies that uh, either uh, pushed toward or against these kinds of consolidation. So there was things to support um, the growth of industrialization, in many cases government affirmative action to try to, 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 to increase industrial, uh, industrialization um, and policies that, that would accelerate that process. Um, so, so you saw some of that in this period and, and in this period you also see courts getting very involved uh, in restricting actions by populists and progressives to try to alleviate some of the um, burdens that come with industrialization. Uh, the most famous case is called Lochner against New York. Uh, but in general in this period, uh, in, in that case and in many others, you see the courts taking a very laissez-faire attitude uh, and saying that legislatures can't actually regulate things like uh, minimum hours, or sorry, maximum hours and minimum wages. Uh, and, and people at the time, they were pushing for things like the eight hour workday, they're pushing for minimum wages, uh, and courts are, and there's some courts that are opposed to these kinds of things. So you see a policy side of it. Um, the third part, I think, of your, of your question is, you know, what did we have built into our system? And, and, and the interesting thing here is that when the founders, you know, come up with the Constitution, when we, when we ratify the Constitution, uh, it doesn't have an economic theory written into it per se, right? There's no place in there that says, um, you know, section, Article 1, there must be a big middle class. It was an assumption. It was a precondition that was part of the social conditions uh, and that was believed to be something that would persist, persist for a long time, and that would be um, pushed forward through policies. So the expansion westward being one of those, which was undertaken even at the time through things like the Northwest Ordinance. But... Uh, but the idea was that this was an assumption, not um, built in. And so one of the challenges uh, is that our Constitution doesn't have in it a particular uh, correction mechanism to automatically self-correct in, in this kind of context where there's a mismatch between the economic conditions and, and the constitutional structure. It requires politics to get to the answer, and it relies on people to make those changes through the political process. Um, and this is something that, you know, that, that even the founders, uh, some of the founders at least themselves recognized. Uh, James Madison in 1829 says, um, you know, lo looks forward and tries to calculate uh, when economic inequality will be a problem for America. He says, when the proportion of people being without property 
will be a problem. He says he thinks it'll be about 100 years looking at, uh, which is in about 1930, you know, interesting that the New Deal, but about 100 years from, from the time when, uh, fr from that time, uh, there'll be restrictions on land, the population will be very large, there'll be people without property. And what he says is, at that time, uh, we will have to revise our laws and our institutions, and it will take for that task all the wisdom of the wisest patriots. Uh, and so there's an understanding that it's going to take people in future generations who are going to have to make revisions to, to these, to these uh, so structures. So clarifying question, does that mean that perhaps things like not having minority rights built into the system, maybe that was another pressure that then wasn't accounted for and sped up that timeline? Or was it simply because we kind of left the economic system, which is kind of infused with our political system, up to their, its own devices. So, well, do you, by minority rights, do you mean uh, women, majority, people of color, okay. slaves, so, right, for instance? Okay. So, not not in not in majorities of minorities, yeah. but in in minorities and identities. So, so let me let me talk about that because I'm glad I'm glad you asked that because that's an important thing for us to talk about. So, um, so the tradition that I've talked about here most of the most of the evening so far is is what I call the middle class constitutional tradition. The basic idea is that to have a republic, uh, you have to have relative economic equality within the political community. Now, that tradition leaves open a really big question. Who's in the political community? And that's a question that was uh, answered in a pretty limited way at the beginning, to say the least. Uh, and it's also been a question that's been fiercely contested, including violently, over our history. Uh, but when we look at our history, we can see another tradition that emerges, which is a tradition of inclusion, which is opening up the political community uh, to include women, minorities, over time. Um, and I think what's interesting about this is that, is, is what happens when you think of these two traditions together. Uh, and, and what happens is that um, if you want the republic, the theory of the middle class constitution to succeed, when you expand the political community, members now, all the members of the political community, need to be able to get into the middle class. Or else the underlying theory of the republic doesn't work. And this is actually something that people throughout our history also understood. So when the Reconstruction Republicans after the Civil War were thinking about what to do, it wasn't just emancipation and political rights. They were fighting for 40 acres and a mule as well for economic opportunity and justice. Thaddeus Stevens, one of the leading uh, Reconstruction Republicans, proposed confiscating the wealth of the top 10% of rebel planters uh, and redistributing that to the free sl freed slaves of the former uh, slaves of the South, um, so that they would each have 40 acres, which would mean they would be property owners and have an independent economic base. And, and he understood this as necessary to have a republic in the South and said that uh, the Southern states had not been republics until this time. It was more like a despotism uh, than a republic. Uh, and that the only way to address this was, was through some sort of action like this. So that was something that was understood. In, in the civil rights era, um, you know, we often forget when Martin Luther King gives his I Have a Dream speech, uh, the March on Washington is titled the March, on, it's the March for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, it's not just political rights, there's an economic component to this too. So there's, there's a place where these traditions run together and, and yes, there, you know, uh, there's certainly uh, pressure that, that comes in in, in, in um, in these ways, and, and I think one of the, the, the tragedies uh, throughout our history is, is, uh, has been the failures of, of people to be able to achieve uh, the goals that they've in some cases set out. So the Reconstruction Republicans fail at, at, their, at their efforts uh, in, the, in the Reconstruction and, and post-Reconstruction period. Um, so that's, a, that's, you know, that's, that's some of the work ahead. Thank you. Okay. I think we have time for uh, two more questions. Uh, so we're why don't we why don't we take why don't we take a couple on each side and then I'll answer them all at once. What? <laughs> so we'll, take, we'll take we'll take two so we can just get more people. So why don't okay. we take I'll take two because I'm long winded. So all right. We'll take two people and then I'll. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, during the election, um, or rather post the results, um, the rhetoric seemed to be about the smooth transition of power and that being the virtue of one of our traditions as a republic. Um, and so I was just wondering if um, there are examples where. Uh, <laughs> being against that sort of transition of power uh, through rebellion or other acts have proven to um, improve dem democratic values that you could speak about. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, we'll take it. Yeah. So my question was, as you have said, like labor unions and, and 
others have been critical in like uh, creating economic equality for people working. But in your idea of like two republics, you only included the republics of, of like Aristotle and the class warfare type republics. So I was wondering if you had a specific reason for um, like issuing socialist ideas for how a republic could be formed. Okay, so socialism and uh, rebellion. So let's uh, we'll start with rebellion. Um, <laughs> There's a link between these two. I, I really want to see this happen. This is uh, exciting. So 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 rebellion. So it, you know, in the in the in the American context, um, you know, the 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 rejection of the peaceful transfer of power. Uh, there there is an example. It's it's Lincoln becoming president, and it's the Civil War coming after that. Um, I'm not sure if, if uh, the questioner is left, but I'm not sure if that count is that if, if that's a uh, if you see that as a salutary example or, or not. But um, but that's but that's the example. Uh, the South secedes uh, af after Lincoln becomes president, opposing his presidency. Uh, Seven hundred thousand people uh, kill each other in the next four years, uh, and, and 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 there we go. So um, so I, I'm not sure if that is a positive example, but that that's the example um, that that comes to mind as 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 uh, as most relevant to, to the question um, on 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 socialism uh, so I, I I'm not sure um, uh, what I'll say about socialism is that the the Republican tradition which is what I'm writing about through the book uh, and it is is one that is um, I think different from a, a, a socialist or communist tradition uh, and so is not uh, the main focus of, of what I'm talking about. Um, and, and that's because I, I'm interested in the origins of our constitutional system uh, and you know socialism in the kind of modern way that we think about it um, or communism in the modern way that we think about it uh, post-date uh, that. And so it is not the kind of main thrust of, of what I'm thinking about or tracing uh, through the history of our, our constitutional history. Uh, the one place that where I will say there's, there's something very interesting that happens is uh, in the populist era, the Knights of Labor, um, you mentioned labor unions, the Knights of Labor see the shift from uh, being independent owners and, and workers, uh, either agricultural or artisanal, to being wage workers as a serious problem. And the rise of the corporation is part of this. It's a big shift that happens. Uh, what do we do now that corporations exist and that there's a few people who own the corporation and then there's these shareholders who, who get money from the corporation and then there's all these just workers and they're not owners. And how do we deal with this? And this is a serious problem, they say. And their answer, though, isn't socialism. There are socialists at the time. It's like government ownership. Their answer is to say, we should make all the corporations into cooperatives. And then the workers who work in them will also be governing themselves and governing the corporation and sharing in the benefits of the corporation. And this will allow them to participate fully in uh, as owners and as, as, as managers, in a way. Um, and, and that was seen as kind of translating the spirit of how work operated in the early republic forward into the industrial age. So there was at least some thinking in, in, in those kind of lines. Um, but, uh, but, but, but that's, that's a, a brief answer. So we'll do maybe the last two and then. Yep. Well, maybe this is just drilling a little deeper into some of the things that others were saying. But when ordinary people like myself and my friends have discussions, it seems as though the underlying assumption is that you can't have democracy without capitalism. Is that true? Oh, we're taking two. Oh, you're going to take two. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. because we have limited time, so we'll sure. take the last, okay, I'll last go, two I'll questions and then we'll, yeah. uh, We've sort of deified the founding fathers in the Constitution as a divinely inspired document whose primary goal, as I saw it, is to protect the rights of white, male, Anglo-Saxon Protestants against everybody else. And it was set It was set up that way. I'll get into a question. The... Uh, uh, how can we call ourselves a democratic republic when it appears today that all the rights and benefits have accrued to the top percent, as was set up to begin with, in that we're, instead of us calling ourselves like a corporatist plutocracy? Because that's where we're headed. Okay, so, two, so a couple things here. So the first thing is you should all read the book. 
Uh, and, and I encourage you to purchase it just over behind this curtain over there when we're done here. Capitalism. Because, because we start, exactly, yeah. You can't have uh, book sales without capitalism. So, so the, but, but, the, but the reason is, the reason is, this is, this is a, great, a great way to start the question. I, I talk about this throughout the book. So the first, uh, there is one, probably one of the most famous books in the 20th century in, uh, in constitutional uh, uh, history, or maybe just in history. Uh, it's a book by Charles Beard called The Economic Interpretation of the Constitution. And this book argues that the Constitution was a document written by a bunch of rich guys in order to rig the system basically to benefit their own economic interests, uh, their personal economic holdings. Uh, and this book has lived in, in a couple of ways. Um, it was very important for historians for a variety of reasons and methods of how to do history. Um, but the second reason is it brings us to this argument that the founding was just about uh, self-serving founders. And you know what's surprising about this is Beard's book is, is debunked decisively in the 50s by people who go back through all of his work and show that it's not right. But the broader claim, that the, this, that's the specific claim, that this was to support their own personal holdings. The broader claim that this was a, you know, a movement, a period that's an aristocratic counter-revolution, uh, that's what the Constitution is. Um, is still stays with us, I think, in a, pretty, in a pretty serious way. And part of what I try to show in the book is that the story is far more complicated than that and, and is very different than we think it is. Uh, and part of the reason that it's different is what's going on at the time. So the 1780s after the American Revolution um, is one of the biggest depressions in the history of the country. Some econ economists think, uh, economic historians think, bigger than the Great Depression, much more serious than the Great Depression. Uh, and the country needs money. It needs money to pay creditors in Europe who actually helped fund the revolution. It needs money to pay soldiers, uh, both um, veterans and to pay soldiers to, to fight Indians. Uh, and, and it needs money to run the government. Um, and they don't have funding. They have this huge depression. And the way they can get funding, because the federal government can't raise taxes, is by uh, having a tariff, which Rhode Island vetoes. Every state had to agree uh, in order to create one. Rhode Island vetoed it. Um, or by asking the states. It was called a requisition. You just ask the states, please give us the money. So they ask the states for the money. The states impose taxes, all kinds of taxes on people. So they impose all these taxes in the middle of the depression. Huge depression, in the middle, impose all these taxes. People don't have the money. This causes gigantic backlash among the people. And so you get these things like printing paper money, uh, debtors against creditors, Shays Rebellion, all this kind of stuff happens in this period. Uh, and the traditional story we hear is that the Constitution is the aristocratic counter-revolution pushing back against this. And you get things like the Contracts Clause, which prevents the abrogation of contracts. And it's supposed to help creditors vis-a-vis -vis debtors. Um, I, I tell a slightly different story in, in, in the book. Uh, I think there was something very important in the Constitution for all the ordinary people, too. And what that is, is that they allowed the federal government to create a tariff, or an impost, is what they called it. Um, and they banned all the states from creating their own. And that's why Rhode Island vetoed it. Uh, and so what they did is they shifted in this process the entire revenue stream of the government from ordinary people, which is how it was structured by being imposed through the states through direct taxes, to basically import tariffs, uh, which were believed to be predominantly paid by wealthier merchants and people living in cities who bought manufactured and luxury goods that were imported from Europe. Because ordinary farmers and artisans didn't buy that kind of stuff. And so there was this shift. And one of the interesting things you see, and I talk about this in detail, is a lot of places where there are ordinary farmers who are deeply opposed to, um, deeply opposed uh, or, or, or deeply in favor of pro-debtor measures, and kind of ordinary people are strongly in favor of the Constitution. They think it's the greatest thing because it's going to solve this problem, which is a big economic problem that is seriously hurting ordinary people. Uh, so, so I encourage you to read the book in part because it pushes back a little bit on the story. Now, this isn't to say that uh, the founders were largely in the context of their time on the wealthier side, that they weren't all white, that they weren't all men. Those are Anglo-Saxon Protestant. I don't know if they were all Protestant, probably, maybe not, I don't know. But, but this is all, that, it's not to say that none of that's true, but it's a more complicated story than the kind of easy version we often want to tell ourselves. And I think part of why that's important is because 
there is a lot in our history that actually does speak to our moment and that actually is a kind of thing that tells us that there are places where we can go uh, to be inspired about what we can do in the future uh, and that it, the past isn't just a place that we have to abandon completely and condemn but is actually something that we can, that we can look at as, as in part a guide, broken at times, uh, problematic at times, uh, deeply wrong morally and politically at times, um, but that there's also some good there that, 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 we, can, that we can use. Um, and, and I think that's what gives us, uh, and I think that's what should give us hope about democracy and capitalism too. Um, and, and the reason why is, you know, the great thing about democracy, the great thing about the founders and thinking about them as I started this, uh, is that it shows that people, humans, us, create the society that we want to live in. Um, you didn't have to write a constitution. You didn't have to write it the way they wrote it. They could have stuck with the Articles of Confederation. They could have done something totally different. But people make the decisions. And that means we can decide to structure our politics and our economy how we want to. Uh, and that's the important thing. It's not natural laws that force us to have a certain distribution of wealth. We choose to, to create an economy the way we want to. Um, and so I think we can have democracy that does that, um, but that requires all of us to be engaged in it. All right. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming out, and uh, thank you for the great questions. Uh, please pick up a book, ask him some more questions over there. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for this wonderful book. It's going to be so influential in years to come. So thank really you all, and, I, and I won't tell anyone about Seattle. <laughs>